Okay. All right. So as many of you know, we had our VBS week last week. <laughs> so if you see some kids wearing the light blue shirts, they have been for the whole week to do the vacation Bible school. During the whole week, the kids have a different Bible point throughout each day. So day one was God is a friend who's real. Day two is God is a friend who loves. Day three, God is a friend we can trust. Day four, God is a friend forever. And day five, God is a friend for everyone. Amen. So VPS is so interesting because it doesn't only just work for the kids. It doesn't just give the message or send the message to the kids, but also all throughout us, the adults, the leaders, the teenagers, God is speaking to us every single day. And that reminded me of the verse from Mark 10. If I can find it. I tell you the truth. Anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. And as I was reading through my quiet time last night, I don't know if you know the guy whose name is A.W. Tozer. He said that I can safely say on the authority of all that is revealed in the word of God that any man or woman on this earth who is bored, embarrassed, or turned off by worship is not ready to enter heaven. So thoughts. I have two questions before we start singing. If we are made to worship, why should we be silent about the wonders of God? If we are made to worship, why should we be silent about the wonders of God? The next one is, have you no desire of spiritual joy? Have you no desire of spiritual joy? Let us pray. Father God, thank you for this Sunday. Thank you for another opportunity, Lord, that we can gather freely to fellowship and worship your name. Thank you, God, for the blessed gifts of sensitivity and conscience and human choice that you have given us. We acknowledge that there is no limit to what you can do through us. If we are to yield and worship you wholeheartedly, showing forth your glory and your faithfulness. We need you, Lord, to remove the veil from our faces to prevent us from seeing your glory. Lord, renew our hearts and minds to have a childlike understanding of you, our Heavenly Father. As we hear about your glories, truths from this pulpit today, may we see Christ. Tear down the walls or tear down the walls that we build around us. Teach us how to wear our emotions on our sleeves. And if there is anything uncertain about how we feel or our future, may we run towards you and tell you outright. Help us to be our authentic selves as your son and daughters today right here in your presence. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us all stand up and sing our first song. Good. 
never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're For all that don't typically worship with us or are visiting or here for VBS, welcome. It is great to have you. It's good to see others back that have not been here in a while. So welcome to you as well. Um, I loved what Darlene said. Unless you have faith like a child. That means unless you receive Christ with nothing in your hands. No claim raised to him by word, action, or deed. You will not receive the kingdom of God. So I'm going to build on what she said. In the next passage in Mark chapter 10, there's the rich young ruler. And he calls him good teacher and yet walks away. So I want to encourage you to have Christ on your lips in your face, be a light in the world wherever you go. I'm going to skip announcements this morning. I just hope you're reading your, the scripture with us and God is blessing you as he, you spend that time with him. Plug into our small groups. They're starting again in February and that's where real connection happens. We can't do that here, but in groups we can. And then finally, if you want to learn more about our church, in two weeks we're going to have a new members class where you can just explore what San Marcos believes. And we believe Jesus Christ is risen and coming again. And he has closed the gap between us and God, and it cannot be broken. So with that, let me invite Lynn Ann to come, and she is going to give us a summary breakdown of the past week. How many years have you been doing it? 20 years? <laughs> yeah. Yep, 20 years. <laughs> Anyone that uh, was part of VBS, if you can join us up in the front here, some of you even still have your shirts on. Um, if you were staff or participants, so that you can see the words and we can help lead them in one of our theme songs. We started every day and ended every day with praise music. And Thanks God was the theme song this year. We have a good representation here. Um, VBS is an outreach program um, that's open to the public and we had over 40 kids that were part of the program, which is a lot more than we usually have any given Sunday at Sunday school. So, hit that track.
And I certainly want to thank all of our volunteers that helped throughout the week to uh, spread the good news. We're going to do a short video and show them the highlights. So if you want to sit right here so you can see the screen or fill in the first couple of benches here because I'm going to call you back up for our exit song. So just get somewhere close that you can see the show. <clears throat> All the words to our uh, praise music really helped them focus. It is an outreach that we've been doing for quite a while. Lois was the founder. Some familiar faces that were even at the first ones. And Peter says, don't keep your gifts to yourself, and they didn't. We had plenty of volunteers that came to help. It definitely is a team effort that takes a lot of effort in preparation. That started back in November, December. People were doing things at home, coming in at church, working on things in preparation. So we were finally Good to go. Our assemblies had reflection time and always a chance to have small group reflection on God's sightings and testimonial ideas of things that they've seen. Lots of skits that talked about the demonstration of the scripture that we were focusing on that day. And each day there was a Bible point, a Bible buddy, a key verse and a Bible story that we would go over those Bible points, Bible buddy, verse and story throughout the day in the activities that they did in the various stations. So the Bible buddies are our reminders throughout the year that we don't forget what we did during the week. So we begin with our sing and dance, praise music. And then we would go to our rotation stations. We had arts, we had discussion circle, reflection time. We had outdoor games. And we had indoor games and received our Bible buddies that we took home as reminders. The decorations also go along with the theme this year being underwater, diving into your um, relationship. And all of the crews were named after endangered species here in Chile so that the kids know that if they could go in a submarine or go scuba diving themselves, they could actually see these animals. And because we know we should love and take care of everything, not just other people, but all the living things that God created for us. So God indeed is a friend forever. Smile and the love of Jesus in their hearts. One big family, if everyone would get up please. We'll show them the enthusiasm and energy that uh, was filled in this room any given day. One big family.
during the week we had a DJ that knew where all the things were and it was all called up and good to go. Now it's in with all of our other Sunday services things, so it's a little bit e more complex to call up. But I'd like to go ahead and take this time to thank each and every one of you for being a part this week because we definitely had a good time together. Uh, you can stay, Lynn and Carrie. You love being up here. Come on. Come on. Now, Jane is going to have to keep me honest here. But I think I've got it right. Well, Lynn please accept this as our gifts of gratitude to you for many decades of faithful service to us. <clears throat> You know, it's really remarkable because our church rotates, as you know. I think James is the longest permanent separation. You were gone, what, six weeks? And it's good to have you back. But Lynn Ann has, has cared for many over these decades. And it's no telling how God is using him. But I like to think about that occasionally. Come here. <laughs> Carrie. These two ladies made it happen. 
These two ladies made it happen. And Carrie is starting to backfill some of what Lynn Ann has been doing. And it is great to see how God gives us successors to work with us and come alongside us as we move. So thank you, ladies. And God bless you both. Oh, you're supposed to read. Sorry. Sorry. I was too, but you didn't tell me. Also, I wanted to tell everyone that uh, the children are welcome to come to Sunday school because, but because of some logistics, it will be they'll be brought back into the service before communion. So, anyway, just wanted to let you all know that. I'm going. I'm Jane Warner. Thank you for coming again, and I'm going to be reading Matthew 11:25 through 30, and I will be doing everything in English today since um, we usually have people that will be speaking in their mother tongue and. Um, in English. Sorry. Matthew eleven twenty five through 30. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray together. Lord, I just want to praise you for your good. You are a provider, our helper, our comforter, and our counselor. Your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts are greater than our thoughts. You created everything, you're in everything, and everything is under your feet. You're slow to anger, abounding in love. You are our everything. Thank you for telling us in Romans 6, we are no longer slaves to sin. We are new creatures, the old man has died. We may have some sin habits, but you see us as saints. Let us think on that, believe it, and live like that. We are dead to sin and alive to Christ. We have been brought from death to life. We are not under law, but grace. We are slaves to righteousness, not slaves to sin. You created us, and we can live abundant lives with you and for you, regardless of our circumstances. Thank you, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Now it's for Hayes turn. All right, good morning. Oh, yeah. That's my turn. I, I, I thought since the pastor was skipping stuff, he was going to skip the reading. Although he skipped announcements and he made some other announcements. But anyway, <laughs> who's, who's counting? Um, tithes and offerings. If I can have, uh, George, if you can help me out. You can't you can help me out real quick. You're just... Uh, Get a tithes and offerings real quick. <clears throat> nope. Yeah, Christina. All right. Let's pray. Father God, we just want to thank you because you are our provider. Every, every good thing that, uh, that we have comes from you, and uh, we just want to thank you for provision. Provision, Lord, and our, for us, for our families, Lord. So we just want to uh, give to you, Lord, these tithes and offerings uh, today, that uh, they will be uh, pleasing to you, Lord, and, and that they will be given with a cheerful heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
just so I don't put my foot in my mouth, Pastor. Are we, are we skipping the congregation agreeing or are we reading? <laughs> okay. So very, very, oh, so briefly, find, uh, find one or two people around you and greet them and share two to three things. I know you have like probably dozens of things you're grateful for, but just find somebody and share a couple of things that you're grateful for today. Mark, set, go. <laughs> you got five minutes or less. So hustle. Start, start coming back to your seats. It's like herding the cats. Bring the kids to the front. All right. If I can have the, uh, if I can have the kids to the front so we can uh, pray over them and dismiss them. Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Hi. Let's go ahead and gather the children so we can uh, so we can dismiss them. Do we have all of them? All right, let's, let's pray for our children. Father God, we just want to also thank you for the children of San Marcos, Lord. Thank you for, for them. Thank you for their families, Lord. We pray a hedge of protection around them. And uh, we also pray that you will continue to impart your word in their hearts, Lord, that, uh, that, that your word will never depart their hearts. We, uh, we also pray for the, uh, for the teachers today that you will... Give them of your love so they, so they can give from, their, from the love that you've given them, Lord, towards these children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to try it like this today. Well, good morning. morning. It's good to be back with you guys for another Sunday here at San Marcos. Uh, this morning, we'll be looking at Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 45. I'll give you guys a second to find your way there. Uh, while you're doing so, I just want to extend another thank you to all our VBS volunteers, whether you were involved with you know, preparation or financial backing or actual boots on the ground. We thank you for helping us. It was, it was really cool to see all the kids worshiping God here, right, as they were created to do. Also, Max Suck. If you didn't know, I was, we were upstairs this morning. <laughs> so I uh, thank you for your patience with that. <clears throat> so hopefully you found your way there to Mark chapter 10. Um, I've split our unit this morning into four smaller units. We have verses 32 through 34, 35 through 37, 38 through 41, and lastly, 42 through 45. However, before we start... I'm going to pray one more time, and then we will dive in. Uh, Father God, I pray that you would be with us this morning. Uh, I pray that you would speak through me, Father. I pray that these would be your words and not my own. Uh, I pray that you would give us all, including myself, Lord, ears to hear and eyes to see. Uh, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for your spirit, Lord, that is amongst us and binds us together, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So in our unit today, we're going to see 
a similar structure, structure and pattern to what we saw in chapter 9. Right? In both the instances, in today's and in chapter 9, we see a couple of similarities. So one, Jesus foretells his coming, betrayal, death, and resurrection, which is going to be characterized as a selfless act in the truest sense of that word, followed directly by an act or response of the disciples, which is going to be characterized as a selfish act. So hopefully this will become clearer as we venture forth this morning. So to begin in verse 32, I'm going to read our section. <clears throat> now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them. And they were amazed, and as they followed, they were afraid. Then he took the twelve aside again and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes. And they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles, and they will mock him, scourge him, spit on him, and kill him. But on the third day, he will rise again. So in this first unit, we see a couple of things. <clears throat> Jesus and the disciples are back on the road. They're making their way to Jerusalem. We then see some characteristics of the disciples. Right? It says that they were specifically amazed and yet afraid. Jesus then takes his disciples aside. He tells them, hey, guys, I'm going to be betrayed, condemned to death, delivered to the Gentiles, mocked, scored, spit on, killed, but I will rise again on the third day. So what do we do with this? <clears throat> well, first, I want to highlight the demeanor of the disciples. It says that they were both amazed and afraid, almost in expectation of what they predicted was to come. At this point in Mark's gospel, Jesus has told them several times that he would suffer and die, but be raised on the third day. And we see the disciples struggling with their interpretation and the reality that Jesus is stating to them. Right? They're in conflict. They continually hear him, but the reality or truthfulness goes in and out. Like when Peter takes Jesus aside and rebukes him in the first occurrence in Mark chapter 8. I think it's fair to say that Peter believed the reality of Jesus' words based on his response. Yes? However, later, as we will see today, this reality of Jesus' prediction goes over their heads as they return to their previous expectations or interpretations. If anything from our scriptures today, they believe that something big was about to happen, which characterizes nicely with how scripture tells us that they were at this point, both amazed and afraid. It's that expectation of the unknown. Second, there are two other occurrences in Mark, as we've mentioned, where Jesus foretells his death and resurrection. The first, Mark 8, 31. This is where Peter is rebuked. And the second, Mark 9, 31. And a third being our passage this morning. So with these three occurrences, I want to highlight Jesus revealing more of what the coming picture entails. In Mark chapter 8, we see Jesus progressively reveal who he will be handed over to, right? He first mentions the religious leaders, and I'm sure the disciples, you know, weren't shocked by this as they had many run-ins with the Pharisees. In Mark chapter 9, he becomes more general in his statement, claiming that he will be delivered over to men. This allows the gen a more general people group and opens the door for other peoples to be included in that handing over, of which the disciples were perhaps... They perhaps missed or simply assumed he was referring to the religious leaders again. However, in Mark chapter 10, we see Jesus provide the most vivid image of what he knows is full well ahead of him. Not only was he going to be handed over, but he was going to be betrayed, formally and publicly rejected by his people, handed over to Gentiles, of which was an additional insult. To have the Messiah, the one that they had waited so long for, handed over to Gentiles and treated in this manner was of the utmost insult. Not only because they were Gentiles, because, but because they were colluding with the very Romans that they hated and claimed to hate. However, the part that I want to hone in on is the fact that Jesus, knowing full well and in all details of what is to come, continually marches onward undeterred. He is in perfect relation and obedience to the Father. He is marching forward to fulfill the work that the Father has set aside for him to accomplish. Right? From birth to resurrection, Jesus fulfills 
all the fathers worked perfectly. In Romans chapter 5, Paul draws a comparison between the first and the second Adams. The first being from Genesis, Adam, and the second, Christ. The first Adam said no to God. He was going to forge his own way, make his own plans, do his own thing, and in essence, be his own God. He was going to eat the fruit, and in doing so, stating, you know, God's law says don't eat this fruit, but my law says I can eat it. He said no to God. The second Adam, being fully man and yet fully God, humbled himself, obeyed the Father in all things, says yes to the Father in all ways, shapes, and forms, even to the point of death on a cross. And here in this instance, we see Jesus' yes shine through as he ventures forth, knowing full well what is before him, right? in perfect selflessness and obedience to the Father's work, right? leading to our first point. Let us continually ask for sensitivity to the Spirit and say yes to the Father. Let us continually ask for sensitivity to the Spirit and say yes to the Father. So continuing to verse 35 through 37. It reads, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us that we may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left, in your glory. So in this instance, Jesus has just foretold his coming betrayal, death, and resurrection, adding that, will, adding that it will also include the Gentiles, showing us a complete selfless act. So now we transition to the disciples. And we can see again that there's a conflict in understanding. See, earlier the, the disciples were characterized as amazed and afraid, which could be interpreted as they understood the reality of what Jesus was about to go through. They believed that he was going to die. They heard what Jesus said, and they may have believed it to some extent. However, you know, based on the question posed here by James and John, we see a reversion back to lack of understanding and poor interpretation. It is perhaps more likely, based on this question of James and John, that the disciples were afraid, afraid and amazed at Jesus' travels to Jerusalem because they understood him to be going to set up the, this messianic kingdom. Their expectation. It was the calm before the storm in their eyes. So they revert right back to their previous interpretation. If they truly believed Jesus was going forth to be betrayed, condemned, suffer, die, and then rise again, then why would they ask him to be seated at his right and left hands? Especially when we see them all abandon Jesus in the garden. Right? When Jesus is arrested, do they hang around with him? No, it's scatter. Every man for himself. So it's perhaps more likely that James and John had planned and waited for this opportune moment to ask for this request so they could secure their spots at the right hand and the left, right before Jesus enters Jerusalem, takes over the city, vanquishes the Romans, and sets up the kingdom that they knew he was going to do. You know, we see the disciples constantly wrestle with the reality of Christ's words against their own. The interpretation that they grew up with, that they knew to be true, and the one that they were comfortable with. They have these ideas in their head. They've tried to place Jesus in this interpretational box. And then Jesus comes and just says, no, I don't fit. The disciples are more interested in an idea of a physical kingdom instead of having the Son of Man standing right in front of them. Right? They're blinded by their interpretation. I think these verses are, are really funny. And sadly, it's exactly how we operate. However, the worst part is, you know, is we have hindsight 2020. We can read, we can look back, and yet we choose to act just like the disciples do here. So with this said, let's take two things away from this instance. First, we can see a juxtaposition or a comparison of our previous unit with this one. If Jesus is venturing forth in complete selflessness, 
then the disciples are still sadly operating in complete selfishness. No. Second, let us not cling to our own ideals, cultures, perspectives, interpretations. As the disciples were sure that they had it right, they knew that Jesus was going to set up that kingdom. This is what was going to happen because this was how they viewed it. This is what they had been taught, what they believed to be true, and what they thought they had read in the Torah, the law and the prophets. So let us be moldable as God grows us up into his image. God doesn't and won't fit into our interpretational boxes. Yes, there is an orthodox interpretation, and yes, there are unorthodox interpretations. However, the point is when you elevate your interpretation, you look up in God and say, God, you must fit into my understanding of what I claim these things to mean. Who's the center of those comments? Do you really think God is going to fit into your framework? The funny thing is that people genuinely believe this, just like James and John do here. Which leads to our second point. We must view scripture through the lens of Jesus Christ, not ourselves. We must view scripture through the lens of Jesus Christ and not ourselves. Like the Pharisees who are excellent at maneuvering around scripture and self-justification in an attempt to force it to say what they desired, let us guard against this. Right? Scripture speaks, we listen. Scripture speaks. We listen. So now I'm moving to verse 38. It reads, But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, We are able. So Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink the cup that I drink, and with the baptism that I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. So we've seen what James and John have requested. Now we get to see Jesus' response. He begins with, guys, you don't understand what you're asking. The disciples continually demonstrate that they hear Jesus' words but they always miss what he's telling them. And here specifically, we see the disciples are operating actually in a pagan worldview. They apply the world's image of greatness to the kingdom of God. They desire to sit at the right hand and on the left of Jesus. They desire their places of prominence. Again, when you stop and think, their mindset is right on par with that of the Pharisees. Luke chapter, Luke chapter 11, verse 43, Jesus says to the Pharisees, Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seed in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. What are James and John asking for here? <laughs> the best seats in the house. Both the disciples and the Pharisees operate under a very similar worldview, and when sadly, many times so do we. Even when we read Christ's words over and over, and we see his actions declaring the same message as his words. And yet we look at it for a second, we think to ourselves, and then we perform the best mental gymnastics that we can and try to reinterpret scripture in a manner that allows us to do what we want to do. Who does that sound like to you? The Pharisees. Yeah. In Mark chapter 7, 9 through 13, Jesus is speaking, and he says, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles father and mother must surely die. But you say, If a man tells his father or his mother, Whatever you would have gained from me as Corbin, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father and mother thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And many such things you do, i.e., there's more. The, the Pharisees had found a way to maneuver around God's word to self-justify themselves 
in a way that would have appeared upright and just, but was really unjust and wrong. I call it the Jesus juke. You guys ever heard this? When someone says something that you know is wrong, but they make it sound, they make it sound moral, correct, upright, and just. You know? And what's hilarious about this is that the Pharisees have thought that they can maneuver and outsmart God. Just like a child who thinks they've outsmarted their parents. It doesn't work. You can't. God is not fooled by that. So how does Jesus respond to James and John's request? So they've requested something, now he's going to respond. He follows with a question. Are you guys able to drink the cup and be baptized with the baptism that I will? And the response is, the response is hilarious and a great mirror for us. So one, they have been told that they don't know what they're asking. Yes? So with having been told that, do they stop and think, hey guys, you know, maybe we should pump the brakes and try to think this thing out course not right the sons of thunder dive headlong right in we got this we're good to go little did they know that they would surely drink and be baptized in the same cup james was actually the first apostle to be martyred in acts 12 and john was never actually martyred in the same sense but exiled and beforehand god actually spared him from dying in boiling oil according to church history so transitioning to our final section, Mark 10, 42 through 45. It states, but Jesus called them to himself and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles, lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So thus far, we have seen Jesus describe his selfless act as he ventures towards Jerusalem. Then we see the disciples completely miss that, and instead buy for selfishness. So Jesus, knowing that they don't get it, he calls them and teaches them again graciously. And here we see Jesus compare the world's understanding of power, positions, and authority against the kingdom of God. The world says, you know, you must have power and you must exercise that power so that people understand that you're in that position. It's like the, almost of the sense of if, if you don't use it, you lose it. It's a very selfish stance. And notice that the focus is always on the person. My position, my power, my exercising of that power, my recognition. Now, this is the exact stance and worldview of the Pharisees and the disciples. James and John were attempting to sneak in at the last second and secure their own positions. Their understanding was Jesus was going to come in and wipe out the Romans, setting up his messianic kingdom. And their only interest here was to use Jesus for what they thought he was about to do. They were going to slide into home at the last second, securing for themselves this sweet position. If that isn't selfishness, then I don't know what is. And yet, we do the same. Even when we have and study scripture, we are no different. We constantly strive to gain some kind of advantage over others. We're looking for the best deal. How can I maneuver to gain an upper hand? We scheme to get our way. I mean, San Marcos' leadership doesn't even escape this. So Jesus knows, understands, and sees this, and yet he calls them to him and patiently corrects them. He explains, you guys are acting like Gentiles here. The Gentiles try to lord over each other. They strive to seize that power, exercise power, scheme to gain an upper hand, manipulate to attain a more favorable position, and to optimize themselves at the expense of all others. Jesus states, this is not how the kingdom of God is. But explains, whoever desires to be great shall be the servant. 
whoever desires to be first shall be slave of all. Which leads to our final point. Let us humble ourselves, rejecting the world's standards of greatness. Let us humble ourselves, rejecting the world's standards of greatness. Throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus consistently have you know, run-ins with the Pharisees. They're constantly at odds. The Pharisees, characterized as the world, consistently say, you know, go left. They're telling all their people, go left, go left. While Jesus will consistently say, go right. If you ever wonder if what the world is saying aligns with Scripture, it's safe to say it's most likely the opposite. The exact opposite. So in summary and conclusion this morning, we first saw Jesus' expression of a selfless act in understanding and accomplishing the Father's work. You know, saying yes to the Father in all things and ways, reminding us to likewise say yes to the Father in like manner. Next, we saw James and John apply a pagan worldview to Scripture, attempting to cast God really in their own image and force God into their interpretational box, reminding us to interpret and read Scripture with caution and to view Scripture through the lens of Jesus Christ. Lastly, let us humble ourselves as Jesus does, reject the world's understanding and practice of what constitutes greatness. You're saying, you have to be thinking, you know, that's not going to fit well into my job, my school, my family, you know, what have you. Guys, the God of creation became a man and said it. So do it. If you pursue this world in whatever ways you're thinking of this morning, for some it's going to be social justice, self-recognition, power, what have you. You're going to work so hard for whatever ways you're thinking for nothing. For nothing. You know, in other accounts, it states Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem to accomplish the Father's work, right? As he's going back to Jerusalem for the last time, he sets his face like flint towards it. So I ask you, what is your face set towards? <clears throat> Let's pray. Uh, Father God, Lord, we thank you for your love for us, Father for desiring us, Lord, for creating us, for pursuing us. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would be with San Marcos, be with our leadership, be with our congregation. I pray that you would be the only thing that we pursue. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, there you go. Thank you, Michael. I, uh, I want to say it this way as well. In his second point, Michael was talking about what we think versus what our design is. Our design is to be indwelt by God. Do not rely on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge Him, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit will keep you on the straight and narrow path. This is the gospel. It is Jesus Christ. It is fitting for us to take communion today, not just because it's the first Sunday of the month. Because, we, but because we've been learning and hearing about discipleship and what it will require of us for a short time 
there will be trouble. But don't be afraid. Our Lord has you in his hand. If you are a believer, whether you're a member of this church or not, if you have professed Jesus Christ as salvation alone, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, Gabby, you're my daughter, Michael, you're my son, then you are welcome at this table. And we want you to share this table with us. Our, our tradition is a little bit different, so let me explain it quickly. We're, we will stand and come to the center aisle in two, two lines. We will fill the table up. There will be someone to help you make sure we fill the table. And then there will be two of us that will distribute the bread and the cup to you. When you, we, when you receive your bread and dip it in the cup, wait until everyone at the table has their elements, and then we will take those together and then move back up the outside aisles. I want to encourage you, look at one another, look around. We stand and we come because we are children of the resurrection. That's not just a fictional narrative. You are children of the resurrection. Our Lord reigns. Come. Oh, start. I'm off a lot today. Forgive me. Forgive me. I'm trying to hurry because I know our time is. So let, let me read. Matthew 26, beginning in verse 26. The Lord said, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Lord Jesus, none of us could do what you did because you are the first born of creation and the firstborn of the dead. You are the holy, true, full man. Lord Jesus, you stepped down and showed us what it means to say yes to God. Your body alone is the sufficient sacrifice of all sacrifices in your name. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Lord Jesus, you took away all doubt that your sacrifice was complete. No trickery. And you became man. And you freely said yes and laid down your life because it pleased God to do this. Not just to be our God, but to be our Savior as well. You left nothing behind. You gave it all. And you will come and get your own. We thank you, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. Now, please. Come to the center and come to the Lord's table.
Receive the benedictions. In the words of Frederick Eman, in his trilogy of sonnets to the love of God for man, he says, if we with ink could the ocean fill, and were the stars of parchment made, and every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole that it stretched from sky to sky. Amen. And now, San Marcos, as you go to your world, and maybe it's not to write sonnets, but it was for Frederick, because that was very popular in that day. Everybody read them. They're looking for romantic sonnets, and he shared the good news of Jesus Christ through it, how we can do that today. What's most pompous? What's healing? That's why we started in the school where we started, because all the expats went there. We knew what we were doing. It was way out of town. Guess who attended the first service? The ambassador of the United States. And he said, Sam, you're doing well. You're going in the right direction. We are still going in the right direction because you know Jesus, you're caring for him, you'll find a way like Frederick Human, to make him know. Part of that is having coffee with me. I'm just gonna ask if some of the men could come up and help us clear, we are long today. So if you would exit and go on to the patio in front of the administrative building and a few extras could help us clear. I would appreciate it. God bless you. Have a great week. <laughs>